universal basic income, which is giving every American $1,000 a month. And are you worried that because you're polling higher that as other candidates uh, get desperate, they'll start offering $1,100 a month? Well, that would be a version of victory, Seth. I've said for a while that I'm either going to win or the other candidates are going to sound a lot like me. I've put things out into the, into the world that I've noticed other candidates a couple weeks later saying almost verbatim. We're automating away the most common jobs in the economy right now. As you know, automation is transforming our economy. It's not this cliff that we're heading towards. It's actually more of a curve that we're on. Uh, what I've been telling people is that we're in the third inning now. And we can't pretend that it can just be stopped or reversed. If you look at it, technology is already doing a number on each of these jobs. So it's not about stopping or reversing technology. But it's going to be very, very bad for many people and communities. So we have to actually change the measuring sticks to something that would actually make our economy work for us. It is about making sure that the tectonic social and economic changes that it could drive are changes that can actually work for us. I was with Mayor Michael Tubbs of Stockton, California. We we're talking about universal basic income, which is another name this goes by. Raise your hand if you've heard of universal basic income. There's an experiment going on right now in the city of Stockton uh, with what's called universal basic income. All right, so if you haven't now, you have. Universal basic income is just a policy where everyone gets a certain amount of money. Where they're actually uh, simply distributing payments to people to make sure that uh, that income floor is lifted. 57% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. The idea is there are too many Americans who couldn't find even $400 in an emergency. We have to accelerate both our economy and society and broaden our definitions of both work and value. Maybe we ought to broaden our definition of work. <laughs> it's original, I'll give you that. My wife is at home, home with our two boys, six and three, one of whom is autistic. And what I say is like, what is her work valued at in GDP? And then people think about it and they're like, I don't know, and I'm like zero. If you are taking care of a parent or raising a child, isn't that work? And shouldn't we honor that too? Because GDP like doesn't consider that actual uh, economic contribution. They're just not uh, in the formal kind of economy, uh, the way that they're traditionally being compensated. We have to change the way we measure progress in our economy. We're going to change how we establish how the economy is grown. We have to actually evolve from GDP as a measuring stick. We're not going to measure it by abstract numbers like GDP. So we need to create new measurements that actually show how we're doing. We're going to measure it by how the 90% are doing. Things that matter to us, like childhood success rates, mental health and freedom from substance abuse, environmental quality, median income and wealth, proportion of elderly and quality care that can actually retire with dignity. So in my administration, I will measure America's economic success based on your paycheck. The indicators already show that we're falling apart. Our country's in trouble. How many of you get excited about GDP when you wake up in the morning? GDP is going up. America's life expectancy has declined for the last three years in a row. And life expectancy is going down. Most Americans are just tuning into 2020 right now. Uh, and most Americans are still finding about, uh, out about me and the other candidates. So now that it's starting to winnow down, people are starting to look for the contrasts. And, and I think uh, it'll be important for me to convey how I'm different from the others. Uh, I like the others. I appreciate the others. I admire the others, but I'm not like the others. Gross domestic product is going up and life expectancy is going down. You sound a little bit like Andrew Yang. Yes. One of my supporters said the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. And so that has been something of a rallying cry for me. The American people, I think, are looking for the opposite of this president. And that's me. Everywhere I go, people applaud and there's a little stage for me to step on. Good morning. It's fantastic to be here with you all. How many of you have seen me speak before in some contexts? So many of you have not, which is very exciting. I'm not a career politician. I'm an entrepreneur who spent the last seven years helping create thousands of jobs throughout the Midwest primarily in Missouri, Ohio, Michigan, Pitt, Pennsylvania. And during that time, I saw firsthand what I believe got Donald Trump into the White House in 2016. When Donald Trump won, how did you all react? Oh, God, thumbs down, tears. I saw it as a giant red flag that tens of millions of our fellow Americans decided to take a bet on the narcissist reality TV star as our president. And if you turned on cable news, why would you think that he won?
Russia, Hillary, Facebook, social media, media in general, emails. But I'm a numbers guy, you can tell by the math lapel pin. And I found in the numbers a very clear and direct explanation that we blasted away four million manufacturing jobs over the last number of years. And where were those jobs primarily? Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and 40,000 right here in Iowa. That's why Trump won this state by eight points. I have been to those manufacturing towns, and when the plant closes, the shopping center closes, people start to leave, the school shrinks, and that community never recovers. That is the pattern I saw play out in Ohio, in Michigan, in Missouri, and right here in Iowa. And unfortunately, what we did to those jobs, we're now doing to retail jobs, call center jobs, and on and on through the economy. How many of you have noticed stores closing around where you live here in, in Muscatine? And why are those stores closing? Amazon. Amazon, that's right. Amazon soaking up $20 billion in business every year, closing 30% of our stores and malls. Most common job in our communities is retail clerk. The average retail clerk is a 39-year-old woman making between $8 and $10 an hour. What is her next move when the store closes? Unemployment, welfare. How much did Amazon pay in federal taxes last year? Zero. zero. That is your math, Muscatine. 20 billion out, 30% of stores closed, zero back. This is the biggest economic transformation in our country's history, what experts are calling the fourth industrial revolution. When's the last time you heard a politician say fourth industrial revolution? Three seconds ago. And I'm barely a politician, which most of you don't seem to mind. And it's not just the changes we can see in our stores and main streets or the self-serve kiosks at the CVS or the grocery store or the McDonald's. It's also the subtle changes. Like when you call the customer service line of a big company and you get the software or the bot, you do the same thing I do, which is you pound zero, 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 say human, human, human. Representative, 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 until you get someone on the line, right? Raise your hand if that's what you do. Yeah, because that software is terrible. As soon as you hear it, you also groan, and then you're like, oh, let me try to try and get someone on the line. But in two or three short years, the software is going to sound like this. Hey, Andrew, how's it going? What can I do for you? It'll be fast, seamless, a little too friendly, perhaps. <laughs> what is that going to mean for the two and a half million Americans who work at call centers right now making $14 an hour? And the rubber is really going to hit the road when the robot trucks come to our highways. How many of you know a truck driver here in Iowa? Most common job in 29 states. My friends in California are working on trucks that can drive themselves. They say they're 98% of the way there. A robot truck just transported 20 tons of butter from California to Pennsylvania two weeks ago. Why butter? I have no idea, oh yeah. <laughs> because there was the biggest pile of pancakes ever in Pennsylvania, and they needed butter, but they didn't want a human to drive it. What is this going to mean for the three and a half million truckers or the seven million Americans who work at truck stops, motels, diners like this one, or places like Iowa 80 and Davenport that proudly says 5,000 people stop there every day? How many people will stop there when the trucks drive themselves? This wave is clearer to you all in Iowa than most of the rest of the country because it started on your farms, then it moved to your factories, now it's changing your main streets. You have to stop it before it hits your highways. So these are the things that I was digging into after Trump won. I was being celebrated for helping create thousands of jobs around the country, and I realized that my work was like pouring water into a bathtub that had a giant hole ripped in the bottom. The water rushing out the bottom had led Donald Trump to the White House, and now it was going to take off because a lot of the trends I'm talking about are speeding up, not slowing down. So my first move was not to run for president. I went to our leaders in Washington, D.C., and I asked them, what are we going to do to help our people manage this transition? And what do you think the folks in D.C. said to me when I said, what are we going to do? So yesterday, someone made like a Scooby-Doo noise when I asked this question. They're like, oh, <laughs> like, oh, like sort of D.C. Uh, the answers I got were, number one, we cannot talk about that. Number two, we should study that further. 
And number three, we must educate and retrain all Americans for the jobs of the future. How many of you have heard a politician say something like that? And I said, look, I'm the numbers guy. I took a look at the studies. You all want to guess how effective the government-funded retraining programs were for the manufacturing workers who lost their jobs in the Midwest? I'm anchoring you very, very low because it is low. Zero to 15 percent. They're a total failure. The reality is half of the manufacturing workers who lost their jobs never worked again. And of that group, half filed for disability. You then saw surges in suicides and drug overdoses in those communities to a point where America's life expectancy has now declined for the last three years in a row. The last time America's life expectancy declined for three years in a row, the Spanish flu of 1918, a global pandemic that killed millions 100 years ago. It is highly unusual for life expectancy to ever decline in a developed country. We're, we ordinarily get richer, stronger, and healthier every year. But not in the U.S. U.S. we've gone down and then down and then down again. So when I said this to the folks in D.C., one of them said, well, I guess we'll get better at it then. And one person said something that brought me here to you all today, this fine morning in Muscatine over pancakes. He said, Andrew, you're in the wrong place. Because fundamentally, this town is a town of followers, not leaders. We will never do anything about this unless you were to create a wave in other parts of the country and bring that wave crashing down on our heads. And I said, challenge accepted. I'll be back in two years with the wave. And that was two years ago. Today, I stand before you, fifth in the polls to become the Democratic nominee and rising fast. Our campaign raised $16.5 million last quarter in increments of only $35 each, so my fans are almost as cheap as Bernie's. <laughs> but there's no corporate PAC money, all grassroots, all people powered. This campaign is about us taking back our own government. And it's sad that it has come to this, but it has. I love campaigning here in Iowa because you all are among the most powerful people in our country today. I know it doesn't feel like it, just woke up this morning, rolled in. But I've done the math. Do you know how many Californians each of you is worth? Lots, that's right. 1,000 Californians each. So you look around this diner, how many of us are there? I'm going to give a Trumpian estimate. There are 400 people in this, in this room. There are, about, there are about 50 people here, which would still be more than one football stadium full of Californians. That's the power you all have. You have power that the rest of the country can only look on from afar. It's the power they dream about. The power to flush the pipes of our government clean of the lobbyist cash that have that's overrun the place. So that is your power. And the question is, how are you going to use it in 28 short days? Oh, well, thank you, Danny. I appreciate you. I appreciate it. Now, if you're here this morning, at some point you heard that there's a man running for president who wants to give everyone $1,000 a month. And I know the first time you heard that, it sounded like a gimmick, too good to be true, wasn't feasible. But this is not my idea, and it's not a new idea. Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country. He called it the citizen's dividend for all Americans. Martin Luther King, whose son I met with in Atlanta, was fighting for this when he was killed in 1968, the guaranteed minimum income for all Americans. It was so mainstream in the 60s that a 1,000 economists, including Milton Friedman, one of the fathers of modern-day economic thought, endorse this plan, it passed the U.S. House of Representatives twice in 1971, and then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where now everyone in that state gets between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked. And what state is that? Alaska. And how does Alaska pay for it? Oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? Technology. Data, technology, AI, self-driving cars and trucks. A study just came out that said that our data is now worth more than oil. How many of you saw that study? How many of you got that data check in the mail last month? If our data is now worth tens of billions of dollars a year, who's getting the money? Amazon, Amazon Facebook, Google, Apple, the mega tech companies that are paying zero or near zero in taxes. Do you see the game, Muscatine? Do you see why it feels like things are getting worse, not better, that you feel like you're getting depleted or sucked dry? Because you are. 
The biggest winners in our economy today are paying zero into the system and laughing all the way to the bank. You are the only people in the country who can change it. Again, most powerful people in the country right here this morning. Now this vision of a trickle up economy from our people, families and communities up, you can make happen just like this. If we take our fair share, tiny sliver of every Amazon sale, every Google search, every Facebook ad, eventually every robot truck mile and AI work unit, we can easily afford $1,000 a month for every American, particularly because the money doesn't disappear in your hands. Where will you actually spend it after you get it? How much of it will stay right here in Iowa? Not all of it, most of it. You might get your own Netflix password. Never. A little bit of it would float up to the cloud. <laughs> but most of it would stay right here in Muscatine. It would go to car repairs you've been putting off and daycare expenses and little league signups and local nonprofits, maybe even Democratic Party dues, make Kelsey's life a little easier. This is what the trickle-up economy would look like. Make us stronger, healthier, mentally healthier, less stressed out. Our kids would have a real foundation for the future. The reason why Trump won is this. If you were born in the 1940s in the United States of America, first, congratulations, because that's pretty good. But if you were born in the 1940s in this country, there was a 93% chance that you were going to do better than your parents. That's the American dream that so many of us enjoyed. That's what brought my family here to this country. If you were born in the 1990s in this country, you were down to a 50-50 shot, and it's declining fast. Raise your hand if you're a parent like me. So if you're a parent, you've had this thought. You've thought, why does it seem like my kid's future is so less secure and stable than the lives that even I led a generation ago? It's because you're right. The numbers paint the picture very clearly. We are leaving our kids a future that is darker than they deserve, and you alone can change it. I'm not running for president because I dreamt about being president. That was not the conversation in the Yang household growing up. <laughs> Genuinely was not. I'm running for president because, like so many of you here this morning, I'm a parent and a patriot. I have seen the future that lies ahead for our kids, and they deserve better. Now, we're getting beaten over the head all the time by these economic measurements that are saying things are great, things are great. You know what I'm talking about? Saying, like, GDP, record high. Corporate profits, record high. You know what else are at record highs in the United States of America? Financial insecurity, stress, anxiety, depression, student loan indebtedness, suicides, drug overdoses, all at record highs in the United States right now. You know what are at record lows? Starting a business, getting married, having kids. Any act of sustained optimism you can find in American life is at record lows. But corporate profits are up. If corporate profits are at record highs, and our people are dying sooner, which do you listen to? The people, that's pretty obvious, but you know what DC is listening to. DC can't even see the people. DC can see the corporate profits very clearly. DC is the richest city in our country today. Think about that, what do they produce? Whatever they're producing, business is good for them. They succeed whether we succeed or fail. Donald Trump wanted to drain the swamp. I want to distribute the swamp. Now, what do I mean by distribute the swamp? Why on earth are you hiring tens, hundreds of thousands of people in the most expensive city in our country? Imagine moving those people and jobs to Michigan, Ohio, Iowa, Florida, pretty much anywhere else in the country. You would save billions of dollars because the cost would be lower. And I would say that they would make better decisions because they live someplace normal and not the bizarre DC bubble. We have to stop measuring our economy through GDP and corporate profits. Even the inventor of GDP said 100 years ago, this is a terrible measurement for national well-being and we should never use it as that. And here we are riding it off a cliff 100 years later. Does that make sense to anybody? Robot trucks will be great for GDP and corporate profits. They'll be terrible for us. So we have to line up 
the measurements as quickly as possible. As your president, I will measure our national progress through things that would actually matter, like wellness and life expectancy, like proportion of Americans who can retire in quality circumstances, because the freedom dividend would stack on top of Social Security. No one can retire on Social Security. Like how our kids are doing, childhood success rates, clean air and clean water, mental health and freedom from substance abuse. I know firsthand how backwards our economic measures are because of my family. My wife is at home with our two boys, one of whom is autistic. What is her work included at in our economic measurements every day? Zero. And you know that's nonsense, that her work is among the most important and challenging work that anyone will ever do. And it's not just her and stay-at-home parents around the country. It's caregivers like Kyle, who's taking care of his mom. It's nurturers. It's volunteers. It's activists. It's coaches. It's mentors. It's artists now 99% of the time, because you know artists can't generate enough money to actually make a living out their art 99% of the time. It's journalists, increasingly. We have put 2,000 local papers out of business because all their advertising floated up to the internet. How can you have a functioning democracy if people can't get information about what's going on in their town? These are the things that we claim to value most highly. The things that we're supposed to prize, like our loved ones, our community, helping people. But the market is zeroing them out one by one. This is what you all have to change in four weeks. Right now, our fellow citizens have gotten confused that economic value and human value are the same things. And we have to let them know, loud and clear, that we have intrinsic value as citizens, as Americans, and as human beings. I know what my son is worth. I don't care what the market says. We have to help people regardless of whether the market thinks that you know that their time has the value that it might have at a certain point you can't turn to thousands of coal miners and say turn to code to, like learn to code that's not a real solution the only reason you would even propose that is if you also had internalized the fact that mark that economic value and human value are the same things you know what i mean like we all have intrinsic value we're the owners of this country the machine works for us. It's not that we all have to plug into the machine. That's one of the reasons why the slogan is humanity first. Maybe the first time you heard it, it was like, oh, be nice to each other. No. It's that our economy has to work for us instead of all us being subject to it. Yeah. So if you want to see this vision catch fire the rest of the country on February 3rd, we need you to show up in caucus for it. We need you to go to your friends and neighbors and say, we can do better for our communities than what we have been offered. Donald Trump's our president today because he told a very, very simple story. He said he was going to make America great again. What did Hillary Clinton say in response? America's already great. I know, it's been a long three years, Muscatine. <laughs> but it's about to end, happily. That response was not right because we need to acknowledge the depth and severity and reality of the problems in our communities. The suffering is real. But we need solutions that will actually move our country forward. What were Donald Trump's solutions? Build a wall, turn the clock back, bring the old jobs back. You know we have to do the opposite of these things. We have to turn the clock forward. We have to accelerate our economy and society to rise to the real challenges of this time. We have to evolve in the way we think about ourselves and our work and our value. And I am the ideal candidate for this muscatine because the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may not know it, but math is an acronym. And what does it stand for? Make America Think Harder. Make America Think Harder. That's right. That's your job in four weeks to move this country, not left, not right but forward, and I know that's just where you're going to lead us. Thank you.